Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you. I'm Paul Yock on behalf of Biodesign. Uh, it's uh, unusual that this is full this early in the, in the evening, and uh, we're going to be in overflow. So those of you who got here on time, you're good. You got, got the seat. Uh, this is a special innovators workbench, so because we have Josh and the colleagues, you, you may not know that this whole program was Josh's idea in the first place, the innovators workbench. So uh, in 2003, we had the first innovators workbench, uh, and there was somebody up here uh, called uh, uh, Dr. Tom Fogarty uh, was our very first candidate. So uh, it's good to have you back, Tom. Uh, and and uh, if you have any flashbacks, let, let us know about that. We, uh, a couple of things just logistically. Um, if you could please put your cell phones uh, on buzz. Uh, we're recording this and we'd like to have it be a clean recording, but we'd like you to use them. So uh, uh, we're uh, doing a live uh, Twitter feed on this. So if you want to participate in that, please do. And on the back of your program, uh, there's the Twitter handle and also the event. Uh, hashtag, so uh, feel free to join in. Um, I wanted to mention also that this is, uh, this spring, the first in a series of three of these events. On um, March 20th, we'll have Joe Almeida, who's the CEO of Baxter. And then on April 25th, uh, Yochi Liu, who's the uh, founder of Biosensors, and he'll be giving us a perspective on uh, MedTech in China. So the other reason this is a special event is that this is uh, co-hosted by the Fogarty Institute of Innovation uh, in honor of Tracy Lefteroff. And we have the CEO of the Fogarty Institute to uh, set that stage. So Andrew Cleland. So I, did, I was just looking at this poll and I noticed that we're co-sponsoring but we didn't get a logo on here. <laughs> <laughs> so next year we're going to go half price. <laughs> I've got a little thing here that you'll get to see in a moment. I think I'm going to have to get Josh to stand up. Okay. Uh, but a few serious words. So Tracy Leftrov, for those of you who don't know, was, a, was an icon, a giant in this field. Uh, he played an enormously influential role in the development of the medtech ecosystem, not just here, but globally. Um, I'll always cherish the time I got to spend with him when I was a young uh, first-time CEO. Uh, we used to meet at his table, and for those of you that know, he really did have a table at Ilfenaya, a special table just for him. And for hours, I'd be schooled in the art of venture capital and venture capital startups. And looking around the room today and actually talking with a lot of people here, I guarantee many of you sat at that very same table. Uh, and so we are a legacy of Tracy's and, uh, and programs like this are the way that we will continue to carry it on. Uh, in his honor at the Institute, we support two programs. The first being the Leftrov Internship. It's an annual program where we invite 10 to 12 college undergraduates to spend their summer break with us and our embedded uh, incubated companies and get to learn what it's really like to be in the startup uh, medtech world. The second is this program that, you, that we're going through today. And I'm really thrilled that we're about to hear from, from one of my role models, uh, also a giant in this field. And that was why I ended up wearing this today that you could see. <laughs> I can show you. <laughs> I did have this. Right? Have you seen that Clint Eastwood film where they all try and work out what t-shirts they have to wear? in the morning to, to map. So I had this, but I thought it would be taking it just a little bit too far to put that on, Josh. <laughs> so that said, I'm going to pass this over to David. And tribute to Tom Fogarty sitting right over there. Before we get started with what I think is going to be a fascinating program, can I just uh, make an acknowledgement that uh, a month ago, Paul Yock was awarded the prestigious Gordon Prize. And I think we all owe Paul enormous debt and a round of applause is minimal acknowledgement for that. So Paul, congratulations again on that. So we, we started uh, to do something very different for this one. Usually we celebrate the insights and genius and the 
and the, the, the history of one individual. And when we started to talk about Josh, because it wouldn't have been easy to get Josh to come up by himself, we decided to expand the program to Explore Med. So um, we're going to start with a little bit of discussion with Josh about Explore Med and what he was thinking about as he launched it and as, he, as, he, as, as, as it developed evolved through the years. We then got project, what are so-called project architects on several of the most interesting companies to come out of Explorement. Not that they all aren't interesting and fascinating companies. You know, all your children are, are brilliant. And then we got two of the CEOs. And I will just note here for those who are taking notes that Bill Facto did not get the memo about dress code today. Yeah, yeah. But I'd like to think of this Bill's way of being contrarian. So those of you who are here because you, you have an inkling of the Explorement story, uh, know, and, and as will be Come, Evan, I think by the end, what an extraordinary group of uh, talent we have here, what an extraordinary contribution these guys have made to medical device technology, and really to thinking about the process of developing medical technology. So it's not just a couple of lucky strikes, if I might frame it that way, but really the fruit of a very, very thoughtful process, and I hope that's what we get at today. So Josh, let me start with you. Um, and tell us a little bit, go back to 1905 when Explorement was started, and talk to us about some of the early goals, what you, what you hoped to accomplish in doing it, and what were some of the kind of foundational principles that you, that you had yeah. set forth. If I can, just, I would just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I see so many friends and family and colleagues, and I just really appreciate you all being here, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I... Before Explorer Med, um, one of the things that I uh, worked on was, it was an interesting, my very first job out of medical school was working for uh, Pfizer. And I was brought in by Hank uh, McKinnell, who was the CFO at the time, had a strategic planning. And he had, he said, you know, let's bring you in, but I got a, a special project I want you to do on the side. And he asked, you know, what is, why is it that we acquire these really innovative companies? They're all fantastic little startups and they come in and why is it that they, um, they stop innovating when they're inside the big company? And so um, he said, I want you to find out and find out if we can still be innovative. How can we do it? And so I had the opportunity to go interview all the founders of, our, you know, of the, the medical device division of Pfizer at the time and, and uh, sort of listen to their stories and try to piece together what was it that they did that was really special and different. And, and it should then, be noted that late 90s, yeah. Pfizer was a major player in cardiovascular That's orthopedics, right. not, a, not exactly. a pure play drug company. Exactly. There was a big medical, $2 billion medical device business at the time. Anyway, the takeaway was that when the companies became mature, they just began to iterate their existing technologies. But when they were starting, they focused on needs. And they all followed a very similar process of trying to understand that needs. Uh, and so what I did inside of Pfizer is create this thing that we call fresh tech, which is the process that you know, later has become biodesign. But that was first the first prototypes of the process. And after many years of proving that that process worked, um, I had the opportunity uh, in really some frustration around this not seeing the big company really grasping on these concepts and being able to take them forward. Um, and that was the motivation to go you know, leave and start a startup. Was Pfizer interested in the process of innovation or were they looking to, to, for you to develop new technologies inside? They wanted both, but what I realized is that <clears throat> big companies, and for the most part, struggle with innovative products, especially disruptive ones. And so they, you know, I remember one pivotal moment that it was really the moment that I decided I can't stay here anymore was when we presented sort of an idea for a new way, a, a new device concept around sealing the openings of blood vessels uh, after they'd been accessed, you know, for an interventional cardiology procedure, because at the time it was a big problem. It's all sort of, you know, been solved by devices now, but at the time there were no devices. And, you know, presented in front of the board of Pfizer, we had this concept, we had the technology, we proved it in some patients in Europe. And uh, the question was, what's the market for this today? and how much is being sold? And the answer was, well, nothing yet. <laughs> and they were like, is there zero market for this? <laughs> and they, they didn't want to do it. And then I was really, I I'm not in the right place. You know? So anyway, I was fortunate, I was fortunate to um, 
Bob Anderson, who is a mentor of mine, who is the founder of Valley Lab, uh, introduced me to John Nira at NEA. And that gave me the opportunity to try to see if I could make this process work in a startup environment. And that was the beginning of exploring. So what was the early structure? I mean, what were, I mean we're going to get to, to Ev and, and yeah. John and Ted in a second, but were you in the early day, earliest days, yeah. by yourself, yeah. sitting in a room? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's how it started. Uh, very meag you know, meagerly with a few hundred thousand dollar checks from, you know, from John Nera and, and uh, Bob Anderson, and that was the beginning of Explorement. So how did you begin to focus on or to decide on the first things you wanted to do? Yeah. Did you have any specific goals? I mean, were you thinking that you'd turn out two companies in a year, no. one company in a year, one in five years? No, I mean, the funny thing that we joke about is like the first Explorement was the only Explorement. <laughs> that, cause it was, we didn't go like Explorement 1 and boldly think we we're going to get another <laughs> chance to do it, you know. So, um, no, it was just Explorement and it was just a way, it was a vehicle. And, um, you know, from that initial effort, we created two companies. And we were very fortunate because the very first one was purchased in about a year um, after we created it. So that gave people confidence. Maybe there's actually something good here. And tell us that what that one company That was a is. way of... Um, it was from an insight, I'd spent a lot of time in urology, and I'd seen the challenges of, uh, you know, of trying to bulk up the urethra for incontinence. It was, uh, you know, it's still being done today with a product called Contagen, um, but there's other, you know, so the idea is you bulk up the sphincter so that makes the sphincter more effective so it doesn't leak. And so, but the problem is that that material can be absorbed and also squirts out, it's a fluid. And so we came up with a way of using a continuous strand of essentially suture material to bulk subcutaneously and create sort of an interstitial stent. So when we talked about <coughs> the planning for this session, I thought one of the most interesting reflections you made, and, and other uh, Explorer Med guys weigh in here as well, um, about how fluid the process is, about it's not like you started out with, we, I want to invent a device that does X. Tell us about how yeah. you got to that first one or two, one yeah. or two companies and Sure. And I guess one, one underlying question is, having had a success so quickly, yeah. did you think, wow, okay, we're, we're brilliant, <laughs> this is going to happen all the time? Well, yeah, I mean, I thought, this one's, I sort of did, I have to say, you know, I was like, this was easy, let's do, let's strike out something hard, like doing percutaneous bypass on a beating heart through at a length of three feet, you know, on a catheter, you know. We'll have that That was Tuesday. the next idea. It was a little harder. <laughs> but, uh, Yeah. No, they all start off with a insight into a clinical need. And, uh, you know, these guys who I'm proud to be here with have all participated in the various phases of that and some in the beginning earliest phase you know, where it's just a problem to solve. So you talked about understanding the, the underlying physiology and so much of our medical device technology started by engineers who begin with identifying an engineering problem. How is understanding the un underlying physiology different mm -hmm. than a different approach than, say, a, a, a trained engineer might, might yeah. take? Well, the one thing that we do just a little bit differently is, and this is something that <clears throat> is really important to us, is we really consider the patient experience. Um, the, <clears throat> the experience of the person who has to go, who has the problem, and sort of what they want actually factors in as well. And I think that, you know, as physicians sometimes, even as engineers, when we tend to look at a problem, it's like, you know, the process is probably kill the prostate, you know, take out, cut something. But <clears throat> the, when you take more of a holistic approach and you really consider the feelings of the people who you're trying to help, it brings you to new ways of thinking about the problem and, and, and forces you down a path that, it, that tends to be much more minimally invasive. It tends to be something that allows, that is more sensitive to um, helping the body do what it would want to do on its own rather than replacing that function or, or eliminating it. So thinking about the first couple of companies, how much time did it take to go from, okay, we're ready to do the next company, to mm -hmm. deciding on a specific project, to actually getting the project yeah. going? Give, it, give us some sense yeah. of some examples. It's pretty variable. I mean, sometimes we get lucky and it takes, you know, I mean, um, John and I have been lucky a couple of times. <laughs> when I somehow it, when, when I'm working with John, if we, if we find it, you know, fairly quickly. I don't know why, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but the we can. is certainly an example of huh? of one that 
yeah. came quickly. Right. But, but some of the other ones were more towards maybe John will uh, yeah. turn to you at this point. Some some com some of these projects I know started in areas that had no relationship to the final technology that was developed. Can you give us some examples and talk about how that process plays out? Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, a Claren was a great example of a problem where Josh actually had firsthand experience. And we looked at three areas, but really quickly zoned in on the solution for a Claren. Um, Which is, by the way, sinusitis. That's right. Sorry. There's uh, treating chronic sinusitis uh, uh, for ear, nose, throat surgeons. Um, Willow, where I am right now, was a much different journey. And this was, uh, you know, whereas a client was a, a couple of months, Willow was actually a, a year-long journey where we went through six different projects, very deep, and, and ultimately they all were fails. And, and the goal here is to not necessarily fail often, but it's to fail fast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we finally came upon the idea for Willow. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was definitely a, a roundabout journey to get to that process. Ted, do you have other examples of projects that started in one place and wound up someplace completely different? Um, yeah, so when I rejoined Explorement with Josh uh, out of my term at Medtronic, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> from the sale of Transvascular, which I was in. Um, uh, what did Transvascular start as? So, so transvascular was. That was the so I, period. I, I remember <laughs> visiting. Tough. So this is back Pfizer days, coming down to yeah. Terrytown. You were with Pfizer, right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and Josh was like, yeah, it's top secret stuff. And I look up on the whiteboard, and all it says is Ivis. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> but it was cool stuff. Um, uh, when I started, what ended up being Neotract. Um, yeah, it, the process is really you're chasing down usually parallel things and trying to see who's going to win this race. And ideally, one of those is, but sometimes not, and you go to a different one. So uh, when we started this, the lead was actually an orthopedic project, mm -hmm. and we were pretty hell-bent on that until we drove it down to a point where it was, you know, that's not us. And, and it, it really defined a, a problem in healthcare that wasn't a device, it wasn't a thing that we do, and decided that's not the right course for us. How mindful were you in the, in the early stages when you're identifying opportunities of other technologies or solutions in the space? I think specifically of the difference between a Clarent and a Neotrack or even so and Willow. Clarent and Willow really introduced very novel approaches to technology, but Neotrack, BPH, that had been a hmm. well-established, long-standing technology, it wasn't setting the world on fire. What did that factor at all into your decision to pursue BPH? You know, we, we still live with this today, and, and that is being new in a field where uh, there's been a lot of wreckage along the way, if you will. <laughs> so um, it's interesting to come up against a customer and be like, oh, yeah, I've tried new things in this. And it's like, well, you haven't tried this, you know. It's, Reminds me of the old days of like, uh, you know, the Newton and pads where it was like, oh, that's a stupid idea. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> it just had to work its way there. I mean, it was interesting for a Clarent and uh, for Willow. What was really exciting about those two opportunities is both of them actually were situations where the technology was essentially the same for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. and, and both of those, you know, the way they worked out, you're, at the end you go, wow. I mean, people just... You know, I can't believe it hasn't changed. And, and ENT especially, they actually prized the fact that they hadn't changed in decades. And, and you know, Josh, I'm like, no, that's, that's terrible. You can't have the same procedure for 35 years and be proud of that. You, you got to be able to move forward. And so mm. those, we love those opportunities when something yeah. hasn't changed in 20, 30, 40 years. We're going to get to the company stories in a minute. Ed, why don't you weigh in here? Yeah, I'd also add to that that it's really interesting when you look at a space that is supposedly so established and they've been doing the same thing for so long, and you look at the number of procedures that are being done versus the number of people who appear to need a procedure, mm -hmm. and you ask yourself, there's a huge disconnect. So this obviously isn't right, it seems like, right. to, you know, to us. So that's when we're, we really want to dig into it further and try to figure out what, what unlocks the, the dam, you know, what breaks the dam. Yeah, a big piece of that is being sensitive to who's not having an outcome that they want and really tuning into that. And you see a lot of, you know, even with the procedure that the outcome may be more invasive or more painful than desired or that there's a big group of people who don't have 
access or can't have it or for one reason or another are you know you know are afraid of it for some reason those are the those are the feelings that we tap into to try to find our, our way. So I think that's, that plays out very interestingly in the, the Clarence story, and we'll get to that in just a second, an issue that Bill, you wrestled with. Before we do that, before we get to some of the other company stories, um, just fill us in on some of the early pieces. You had a very early, a quick exit with the first company. Yep. The next two would take years and years and years. How are you financing? <laughs> well, yeah. uh, maybe I, yeah. let me it's take okay. back one year. It's, it's the truth. <laughs> let me take back one year. Um, <laughs> How are you financing the companies, uh, and, and uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. how uh, did you retain confidence that this was the right model in, in the, as the time to exit stretched out? And you were doing this all at a very interesting yeah. time. The 2000s were a period sure. when yeah. financing was robust in the middle, got very difficult at the end. That's true. Well, look, I have to give NEA credit for being a fantastic partner um, to me, uh, John Nera, who I wish was here tonight. Um, uh, you know, was instrumental in making this all happen, and his confidence and strength through lots of difficult times <laughs> and reason and moments to not believe is really why we're all here. I mean, there are any, every one of these companies uh, has had their challenges and moments of, um, you know, almost complete um, uh, failure. Mm -hmm. So, um, did John ever pull you aside and say? Josh, I love you. I'm behind you 100%, but I just got killed in the partners meeting, and can you give well, yeah. me something to go on? Well, yeah. I mean, I'd say there was a moment in Transvascular's uh, trajectory. I remember the conversation really well. And he's like, you know, basically that is the preamble. And do you think you can get this out of the the bad place? <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, I'm going to do you know, like, There's kids in the audience. I'm like, I'm <laughs> yeah. just, you know. the, uh, the bad place. <laughs> yeah, the bad place. That's exactly <laughs> his words. Exactly. Uh, and I said, uh, I am not sure, but I'll promise you I'm going to try it, work, work my ass off to try to make it happen. And he said, all right, let's go. One of, so the, one of the challenges, I know, I mean, I've, I've written a lot the on truth. incubators over the years, and one of the challenges that they faced well, that, they, that many of them have faced is that they get involved so early. Hmm. They do it before the financing is often in place. And so not only the company's financially stretched, yeah. but the incubator itself is, is financially stretched. Tell us a little about the early financing strategies. Who besides NEA was in there? Mm -hmm. Or was NEA writing all of the checks? No. And how did, you, how did you sustain Exploramed even as the companies themselves right. were evolving? Well, early on, again, if you remember, I had no intention that the Explorer would have any other life beyond the first one. And in fact, when we came up with the two ideas at the same time, we just said, well, okay, let's see if we can get this one off. And, you know, like it was sort of like an inconvenience that both of them seemed. And the second one was? The th was Endomatrix and then Transvascular, right. the first go. And so we said, let's just get this one off and then we'll fo I'll, I will focus on Transvascular and go in. I was the CEO for the several years which is a huge learning experience mm -hmm. that I don't want to repeat. But, um, but basically, um, you know, we were fortunate to see that one uh, exit. And again, that gave people confidence maybe we should continue to write the check. Ex Transvascular was an incredibly, I mean, just a far out idea, a real stretch. I mean, it was an idea that the technology which would enable it. I don't really think many of it has been invented yet. <laughs> um, so we struggled with all sorts of things and discovered things about the human heart and physiology that most people don't know and I hope don't have to know. <laughs> um, but, um, but we were able to you know, get there because um, we sort of dodged and we even reinvented ourselves and found a path at the end. Now you've been very fertile over the last 20 years, 23 years, I guess, going back to the beginning. But there was a period of time, 20, 2008 to 2012, when Explorament launched no new companies. Why, yeah. why was that? Uh, that was the period of time that I became a activist. <laughs> <laughs> and I basically, I, re I went to my board and Bob Crosey, and who's here tonight, um, and, uh, and, and John Neer and Bob Anshin basically said, hey, I, this, FDA stuff is killing all of us, and I need to. We need to fix it. 
and will you guys be behind me if I basically, I'll support the existing companies that have we've created, but I'm going to take two years and, well, I didn't know it was two years at the time. <laughs> I, I didn't know how long it was going to take, but I said I'm going to throw myself into this and in the front of it and see if mm -hmm. I can make a difference. So It also coincided with one of the worst financing times because as we know, yeah. 2008, the horrible. global recession. Did that, was that a kind of fortunate uh, occurrence in that you took the time off just at the time of harder? Do you think it wouldn't have made no, much of a difference? Any, it would have, I think, I mean, we just sold a Clarence. I mean, this is on the heels of a Clarence uh, sale. So, you know, everybody was feeling good, wanted to do it again. But, you know, this is a devastating time for all of us. And mm -hmm. so um, I just felt like, you know, fortunate to have had the success and felt that now it's time for me to give back. And this opportunity just sort of came right at me. It was like Mark Lee, he, um, you know, was looking for someone to essentially be a lightning rod to, upon which many bolts could be thrown, mm -hmm. but that could be represent innovation, entrepreneurship, physician, you know, and, uh, you know, that was me, so. When you poked your head right back up it. at 2012, did you know what your next project was going to be, and what, what was it? Um, I didn't. No, I never know what the project's going to be. I, we seriously, like, didn't I teach anything. my students, some of whom may be here. It's like you just got to start with a blank slate of paper and go, what's the big problem we want to solve? What's, mm -hmm. what's an area we care about? And just go at it from scratch. Great. And that's what we did. So we're going to turn now to the project architects, as they're known within the Explorer Med Halls. And, and we structure this program specifically around to tell some company stories. So we've got the Clarence story, you've got the Neotrack story, and John as the solo is going to tell the Willow story. But before we get into the individual company stories, Ed, John, and, and Ted, uh, Ted, you have been with, uh, silly with Josh the longest because you were at Pfizer. What to your mind was special about the Explorer Med strategy? What was the appeal to you and, and why would you take a, a leap from your previous jobs, unless you're unemployed, uh, to join Josh uh, at Explorer Med. Yeah, so I'll jump in just real quick, Ted, before you go. So I, I came from a big company. I came from Guidant. Um, I had been working there for several years uh, when I met Josh. Um, and when I started talking to him about the possibility of joining him at Explorer Med, um, there was two things that really jumped out at me. Um, one was his holistic approach at looking at um, needs. Um, focusing first and foremost on the patient's need, but then also making sure that all stakeholders were being considered um, before any solutions were ever brainstormed or thought of. Um, and the second one was uh, the model of rapid iteration. So we just, you know, are always building, testing, trying, learning from that exp experience, building, testing, trying, until you get to the point where this is just going nowhere, kill it, and go try something else. So talk to us about some of the early projects you were involved with and, and how they evolved along, how they, how they uh, progressed, how they got from where you started to where you wound up. Um, so they, they never really take a straight line path. Um, so they, they zig a lot of different ways. And one of my uh, fun stories I like to think about is uh, Anton Clifford, who's actually not, not here tonight, I don't think. Um, but when he was working on uh, osteoarthritis of the hand, he was reading a bunch of clinical literature about um, osteoarthritis all throughout the body. Um, saw a interesting observation in a clinical paper about reduction of weight helps with um, reduction in pain and improvement in you know function. And we actually took a zig and decided instead of focusing so much on hand right now, let's take a look at, at knee. And you know ultimately he ended up with his, his company Moximed. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, always being very uh, eyes wide open, ears wide open, talking to physicians, talking to patients, reading and learning, and being open to moving and adjusting to what you're learning. So let's talk about the Clarence story. We've got John and, and Bill here. And John, you should start because you were there at the beginning of the Clarence story. As you mentioned before, it came from an obvious place. You guys were, were wrestling with the issue. You had identified chronic sinusitis as a as a condition, but how did you get from those original ideas that there might be an opportunity there to what later became a Clarence? It's a great question. The, uh, so, you know, it really came, Josh said, hey, we, we started looking at three different areas, uh, completely different clinical spaces, but he said, hey, we should think about ENT because of what he had dealt with and how he had gotten treatment, 
but it didn't work and asked for more and the physician wouldn't you know operate and so he said oh let's let's go meet a physician and follow them around and and it was actually interesting that first physician actually was like there's really nothing to innovate in the ENT space That's we right. We've got it. Uh, we actually had this great innovation 20 years ago. Uh, you used to have to do these awful procedures. Now we just have to go through the nose, and it's great. And it's bloodless. And <laughs> so it's like, great. That's, well, I guess, you know, like, Josh, I guess we've got nothing here. Uh, but then uh, he was nice enough to say, you can follow me in clinic. You can come to surgery. And so Josh and I go into surgery, and we watch the surgeon, and they're all in there. I'm like, OK. And, and you, it's on an endoscope, so it's on a camera. And you see the structure, and they see it take out this blade, and he cuts, and all of a sudden, the screen goes red. <laughs> like, like, whoa, what just happened? And then there's the, you know, the cell saver. You got the blood going in the canister. And, and he pulls out this thing. And it's like the size of my thumb. And he puts it in the pan, and they keep operating. And what was I'm dumb. Thing? I'm dumb. I go, hey, doctor, that, so that's it, right? That's the cause? He goes, oh, no, that's, that's in my way. I got to get, get that out of my way. So I, it's healthy. I got to get past it. And Josh and I looked at each other and went, this is a problem. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, and, and I think to Josh's point about thinking about the patient, um, you know, the surgeon was like, hey, we've innovated. This is great for, it not said, us. And it's patients, you know, and they didn't really talk about them. And then we talked to patients and they were like, I have this procedure and I'm laid up for a week or two and I feel like someone hit me in the face with a baseball bat. And so for us it was the ding, 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 there's... There's got to be something better. And, and the approach is agnostic to technology. It's agnostic to solutions. It's just, what's the need? And then figure it out. And how did you figure, how did you come up with the idea of a balloon approach to science platforms? This science was a, a great aha moment for us where um, as we're learning and about the procedure in the area, we're reading books and you know, reading clinical articles. And it was this removing tissue and then seeing a CT scan. I mean, it's this kind of, well-known story for us, and, and Josh, you look at it, it's a black and white image, and it looked like an angiogram, and Josh, Ted, and I were with Josh for the last seven years toiling at this cardiovascular project known as transvascular, yeah. but it was an angiogram, and we had lived catheters for years, and so that was the, hey, maybe we can navigate around with something flexible and preserve the anatomy, and maybe by preserving the anatomy, it's a better experience for patients. And so yeah. that, was the, that was sort of the genesis and the approach to this. To this. And how long a p time period was it between the time when you identified sinuses as a, sinusitis as a condition you wanted to address and you, and you launched the, the Clarence technology? Well, Bill, Bill would say this all the time, and so you didn't you didn't launch the technology. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. I just did for that. the record, I'm just the engineer. <laughs> so, we, we didn't let them out of the clear. cage and talk so to let's, customers. Let's bring, <laughs> let's so bring concept, concept of commercialization yeah. in 18 months. So that's really? the, that was the race for a clearance. So, Bill, how did you get involved? You, were, uh, uh, you, you came in earlier than, say, Dave did as the CEO of NeoTrack. How did you get involved, and what did you think at first? And you, did you have any experience in the ENT space? Uh, no experience in ENT. I, I had been at, G, at U.S. Surgical, and we had lots of products throughout the body, but um, there wasn't much in ENT at that time. And Hank Plain introduced me uh, to Josh. <coughs> and, you know, I, I think we're going to talk a lot about Explorer Med and the culture and all that, but, uh, you know, what struck me was this is a very paranoid group. <laughs> 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 I mean, I went through eight or ten interviews before they told me it was an ENT. <laughs> And that is the, that is the absolute truth. No that is the absolute <laughs> truth. Even my buddy Hank Plain wouldn't tell me. He's like, like I know Josh is weird about this stuff, man, but uh, until he knows you're the guy, he's not going to tell you. So I met with board members. I met with this guy um, a few times. And, um, and then I finally get to a point where I've convinced the board that I'm worthy to know what the topic is or the area. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they're all excited, and we're in the boardroom, and, and uh, Josh pulls up, you know, this laptop, and the first thing is a picture of a nose, and I said, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, plane, did it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know, here I am in Abbott and cardiology and endovascular and drug loot extents, and, you know, there's this picture of the nose, and, uh, and these guys, you know, start to walk through it, and, and it, you know, it just started to 
to make sense after a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't say yes, they'd have to kill you. So. Yeah, uh, uh, it was uh, it was an interesting process. And then this guy, you know, he, you know, again, the family atmosphere at Explorement is is something to talk about today. But um, not only are they paranoid, but you know, they have their secret handshakes, and and uh, you know, they all go to lunch together, and you're not invited, and. And, you know, Josh, uh, in his kind way, you know, basically said, listen, you're the guy, but our co-founder, he's not sure yet. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, why don't you take him out for a beer or something? You know, this is after like 15 interviews, right? And I'm like, just the R&D guy is really going to you know, block my uh, CEO <laughs> opportunity. So uh, I'm like, fine, you know, I'll do that. And uh, so... Chang, you know, gets up early, comes in early, but he also, and and I have a lot of respect for him, he, he wants to be home for dinner, and, you know, 5.30, the dinner bell's ringing, <laughs> um, and, but he'll work after hours, and, and uh, so about 5.15, I think I said, hey, you, you want to go grab a beer? And he's like, I don't like beer. <laughs> <laughs> Set, like, it was a setup. Yeah, which, Josh which, set you up. Which, which, at that point, <laughs> I had never know. seen an engineer that didn't like beer. Right? <laughs> I kind of knew I was in trouble, but uh, uh, but we, you know, went to I don't know where we went and got you a iced tea or something at the ice at the Oasis. And uh, uh, but I I I got there through Hank and Josh and met John Nira and Bob Anderson and you know was really impressed by the people, right? And you know, at least for me, it's always been people, product, and opportunity. Um, you know, the people were best in class. I, I'll never forget that I think I was just getting familiar with Google and how to do searches on people. And I searched Josh and like, I'm like, this can't be the same guy. <laughs> I mean, he's, got like, he's got like 100 jobs. And, uh, you know, he's at NEA. He's, he's just, he's started all these companies. And, and you know, it was uh, amazing to transition from what you know Abbott which was a wonderful company and I enjoyed and I learned a ton at Abbott uh, but to go to Explorer Med and to see the pace at which people were moving was mind-boggling so and John set up the Clarence story I thought in an interesting way uh, when he talked about the initial resistance or reluctance of this physician surgeon to acknowledge that there was any need for new technology because I think one of the most interesting aspects of the Eclarence story is it was this highly disruptive technology, which, which of course everybody aspires to develop, but it ran into tremendous clinical opposition. You came out as CEO, and obviously your, your main responsibility was to make this company success, drive revenues. Talk to us a little bit about that resistance and about um, the kind of opposition that you had, particularly from KOLs. We sometimes think of KOLs as the ones who introduce the technology and, and vet it and, and give it a kind of imprimatur for the, for the rest of the community. You ran just the opposite problem. The KOLs hated this idea. And, and just as a kind of thing, you started U.S. Surgical, one of the premier surgical device yeah. technology companies. Did any point did it occur to you that, you know what, you don't introduce radical technology to surgeons. That's not the way they think about things. Yeah. Well, again, this is the paranoia. That, uh, <laughs> so the the good news about Explorer Med when you are um, underground is that you get opportunities to work on IP and and get competitive advantages, right? And it's such a competitive world that we live in, and and when you're filing patents, every day matters literally at times. And and so you know, Josh was very adamant, um, you know, and rightfully so. Hey, this is a great idea. Uh, it's new. It's novel. Um, let's protect it. So when we launched, uh, there were only eight ENTs in the world that knew what we were doing. And uh, we had just run a clinical study. We had FDA clearance, and we show up at this AAO meeting and uh, with a big booth, and, you know, people are going to love us because uh, we've got a great technology. Uh, so we, we presented day one at the ARS. There was cadaver data that was presented, and, and people just stormed our booth. It was amazing. And I think over the course, uh, we took uh, four or 500 leads. Uh, day two, first thing in the morning, uh, this guy, Charlie Koopman, shows up and says, you know, let me tell you something. You guys cannot use existing codes. And David Kennedy and I are going to, who's the thought leader in all of ENT, uh, are going to, you know, put, put it in writing in a bulletin. 
and we do not, we, we, you guys should be using miscellaneous codes. And this is after we did a ton of research, read Smith, looked at all the codes, had one of our advisors that was on the, the committee, and he had presented this uh, um, to support and say, hey, there's a new technology. It's a balloon that's being used in sinuses. We believe that you should use existing codes. And this guy, David Kennedy, stood up and said, if you use existing codes, you will go to jail, and I'll help put you there. So what was their That was, uh, like, yeah. interesting. What was their concern <laughs> about the codes? Was it, was it really a reimbursement issue? Were they simply trying to keep the technology off the market? And why? If that was you know, the, what's amazing was I didn't figure this out until many years later. But, you know, one, there's pride of ownership, right? So David Kennedy was the, the father of sinus surgery. And, um, you know, they controlled all the journals, um, and he believed he had the best way to, 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 to treat yeah. sinuses. He had written the book already, and this is not the way it was supposed to end. Yeah. <laughs> and he just could not get his arms around the idea of a balloon. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to even look back in history when mm. concepts of balloons did come up, and he, he, he killed it. And uh, so uh, I think the... What turned out to be the case and what made a Clarent so amazing from my perspective, it reminded me of, of the Lap Coley days when I was at U.S. Surgical, is the technology was the equalizer. And, you know, and, and one of our advisors told me that one day we were doing a live case and, and we had a guy from Biloxi, Mississippi doing a live case in front of, uh, you know, 300 physicians. And Bolger, you know, I mean, it was just, they were irate. Mm -hmm. And Bolger said to me... It was a major... Uh, Thought leader, and big and thought leader on our side. He was anonymous. He He's the first guy we ever talked yeah. to, and he says, I, "I get it." You know, he, he says, "If I was over there and not involved with the company, I would be just as irate." And and the and the reason is these guys, the rhinologists, the academic rhinologists, have spent so much of their career fixing other mistakes and being so good, and they differentiated themselves and they had great hands and they had good outcomes, and they were kind of protecting the space. Uh, and saw themselves that way. And then all of a sudden this guy from Biloxi, Mississippi shows up and does a frontal sinus case with a balloon and it's pristine. Uh, and, and no one could match that with surgical skill. And, uh, and that was a big, yeah, very quickly, which you know, is never good and, and for coding. People in the audience may remember there was a front page of the business section of the New York Times, Reed an Anderson. article, Reed Abelson saying, Right. Essentially, this is the stupidest technology, <laughs> and all these KOLs saying no one's ever going to do this, right. and this is really insane. But that was not her initiative; that was problems. So, how quickly did you get over that? Because it sounds like the rank and file. I'm still not over it. <laughs> <laughs> there are deep scars here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen. I, you, you know, we waged. showed up with. Uh, it, it, uh, Clarence was amazing in one way. Is it was a wonderful idea. It was. Um, an amazing outcome. I mean, it, it, it really is clever. Amazing and team. all the things that team. we anticipated, I anticipated when I joined as CEO, could go wrong. None of that stuff went wrong. I mean, we got you know, FDA clearance, the clinical trial results were fantastic. We could manufacture the device. Our COGS were at like 80. I mean, our, our margins were at like 80%. We scaled. We never had a back order. I mean, all that stuff went incredibly well. But when you Try to go talk to a doctor about doing what's best for the patient. That's when things went south. <laughs> and non-coverage decisions. I mean, we yeah. sat there, and I tell you, you know, talk about dark days. When you're in front of your yeah. computer and Blue Cross Blue Shield sends you an email, non-coverage, and all, all, or, you know, every uh, Aetna, and, you know, they keep coming. Non-coverage, non-coverage, yeah. non-coverage. If doctors can't get paid, hospitals can't get paid, you don't yeah. have, you don't have yeah. a business. And this is the thing that Ted watched and, and designed a very yeah. different strategy with respect to Neotrack. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I do have to ask, did David Kennedy ever, <laughs> ever adopt the uh, Clarence procedure? I got all my friends in marketing <laughs> over there. They're all shaking their so. heads no. no but he did so. say, if yeah. I'm ever in like Peoria, Illinois, and I have to go in from a, for a frontal sinus, I'd rather have a balloon used on me than a shaver <laughs> by some guy <laughs> in the middle of the that's right. so, so that's a big win. Don't quote me so that is a good seg <laughs> into the Neotrack story. And Ted, why don't you begin? I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether there are more similarities or dissimilarities between the two. But I guess with a Clarence, what you had is, a, is, a, is a, a base of surgeons, particularly KOLs, who were, for the most part, pleased with the technology and not particularly receptive. Slight tweak on the... EPH front where you had a group of physicians who weren't really happy with the current technology solutions. Take us through the beginning and then Dave, you tell us about how you got there and joined as well. 
So, I mean, every, every one of these is always really different, and it's really uh, has to do with what the play is, how much work has to be done in which sector, and the things that you don't anticipate, right? So, um, however, they are all the same in that they start through this process, and it's really that foundation from which you weather all these seas. I mean, basically, if you've got the right idea for the patient, and you know what those criteria are, the sort of guardrails that you cannot violate or go outside of, one way or another, at least that's the way it's worked so far, you get there. <laughs> and um, Neotract was one of those uh, lot of C's and you do finally get there, but it was uh, over a decade of work to, to bring it forward. When, when did the uh, conceptualization, if I my ideation, I hate that word, but mm -hmm. conceptualization of, because Neotract I think was a very early company in ExploreMed. Yeah, uh, well, or actually, was it? no, it was, it was just thing? after uh, a Clarent, um, and Bill remembers this well, because uh, Bill and I had very different jobs. He was uh, brought in to launch a company and build a commercial team, and I was hired to sit at my desk and think. <laughs> and, uh, so, and then it was every, it's like, I had a, Not a trap you were going to fall into. <laughs> I, I was president and CEO of that place to one be. job. <laughs> And Bill would walk by every day and be like, nothing, <laughs> nothing today, <laughs> nothing today. And then Lots of then I got to know out. him. He's got a good personality. So I walk by and go, tick tock, <laughs> <laughs> tick tock. <laughs> yeah, that's when I started getting projectiles. Anyway, so when, so. Did, when did the idea that Neotract, or what you were thinking of that would eventually result in Neotract, when did you settle on VPH, and, and what had you thought of? What, what were you? What was the thought process before that? What was it? Yeah. So um, while we were working on what was the lead project, which was this orthopedic idea, I'm not going to go down that road. But basically, while we were in that, we were also working on uh, other things. There was a group, and this is another thing that ExploreMed does. If a group has IP and says, "Hey, we don't know what to do with this thing. What about you guys? We'll take a look at it." Um, and we did, and it was one of those things I fooled around with. It was in BPH. It was not a good idea, but it was. It got us thinking. And um, then I, you know, it's kind of like when you're buying a car. You, you're all of a sudden you see that same car going by everywhere. And that happened with this. It was just everywhere. Um, and it was with my dad, my uncle, and it really became this um, passion, at least personally for me, kind of like Josh had with chronic sinusitis, just this sort of thing of, okay, not, uh, dad and uncle first, that's me next. And, and then it's also this kind of like, wow, this is a epidemic really. And I still think of it that way. It's a, it's an epidemic of, um, what I call Y chromosome disease, which is men put off healthcare forever. <laughs> and, and in this space, they really do. And they suffer later because of it. And so, our whole premise going after this was how can we how can we flip that how can we actually have them seek the care they need earlier in the process really so happened. the difference in, with a clarent between uh, traditional conventional approaches to sinusitis and using a balloon is fairly obvious what was the state of the state of BPH treatment before and how did the Neotrax technology differ and represent an, uh, an improvement all right so briefly Basically, this is benign disease of the prostate, and yet everything in history that had been thrown at it treated it like a cancerous tumor. Basically, either cut the thing out or ablate it, damage it, scar it, poison it, whatever it is, that's what it always was. And all those, that basic premise is exactly where all the complications came from. And really, our sort of flip of this was to say, can we take a, a play out of the cardiology playbook and basically say, this is benign tissue, can we just get it out of the way? And that, that really was like sort of... Like opening a coronary hmm. artery. Yep, a lot like that. And they had tried stents, but in fact, I was at Pfizer when we had the wall stent, and the mission was put <coughs> everywhere in the body, and it went almost everywhere. And the biggest one actually went in the prostate, and it was called the Uralume. And that um, didn't work out well because it was too much material, and it had all sorts of complications that happened, but it was still interesting in that it did work and why, and that kind of led us down that road a bit. So Dave, let's bring you in here because unlike Bill, again, one differentiation is who hadn't worked in ENT, you were a seasoned veteran um, and came in relatively late in the uh, in, in Neotrax trajectory. What were you doing? And again, we're playing off the uh, Clarence story 
Did you have any qualms that this wasn't going to be accepted by the marketplace? And well, let's define late. Um, the technology <laughs> um, still hadn't been FDA cleared, hadn't enrolled a clinical study. There was no reimbursement. Um, so we had, a, we had a lot of commercial milestones to go over. Uh, practically done. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I came on board in uh, 2011. I've but, spent... But they didn't tell you that until Yeah, after yeah after. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So my, my career has been spent in, in urology, and, you know, there has been so much collateral damage in the space uh, that, um, you know, BPH was never attractive to me because of, you know, the capital equipment that was required. Um, you know, the Urolip story resonated really because of the, the overall patient experience. And so for us, uh, I actually met um, these guys at a J.P. Morgan meeting when I was running the coloplast urology business, and they were pitching uh, the story. And I went back to, in 2011, to my VP of business development at the time and said, hey, put this company on our lookout space, because I really did like the value proposition. Fast forward to, to May, I get a call from um, one of my mentors, uh, uh, Josh Levine, uh, there was a CEO and mentor and said, hey, I just gave your name to this guy, Josh McHour, uh, about potentially becoming the CEO. And I, candidly, wasn't looking for another job. I had a, a great career. Uh, but as I had a chance to, um, you know, do some due diligence on uh, Neotrack, on Josh, and, and the technology, and I would also say, you know, people like um, Bob Croce and NEA and, and the investments that they were willing to make to move a, a technology forward, uh, I didn't want to be on the other side of this thing. Um, I will tell you, the first, uh, my first board meeting after I took the position, uh, the big thing that we focused on, uh, and I'm sure you remember, I um, said we're going to take revenue off the table. We're not going to have a discussion around revenue. It's going to be around execution. And that's really what we focused in on was making sure we did things the right way uh, as we introduced the technology. So you did have several execution challenges. Can you talk about some of them? I know you and I were talking before. You had a layoff of 20 people the day yeah. you got there. What, Welcome what to Neotrack. My first week, we did a riff. Uh, you know, we, uh, the, the, the commercial execution prior, but again, we, um, I think we had a 206 patients to try to enroll in a cl clinical trial. I came on board in June, June of 2011. We'd enrolled 42. Um, a lot of uh, expectations around the OUS market. Uh, I think they were projecting to do somewhere around $20 million, and I think we had done less than 40000 um, <laughs> And so needless to say, uh, we yes. had to do a riff uh, uh, week, week one of the organization to really keep uh, uh, things moving forward. And, you know, for us, it was really around getting the organization focused in on enrolling the clinical trial. So we were able to enroll 206 patients. We enrolled 90% of the trial between June of 2011. We uh, completed 100% enrollment by December of that same year. Uh, we were able to uh, get our CP, get uh, FDA clearance, and then we were able to get our CPT1 code 15 months after FDA clearance. And I, I want to get to the Willow story running against time, but, you know, just to put a cap on this story, um, I'm sure most people know in this audience, you were, by 2017, 2016, you were teeing up one of the most uh, highly anticipated IPOs, public offerings, only to pull it back because you got this phenomenal offer from Teleflex. I don't know if I got a question there, but it's just an amazing story of, of yeah. execution and and a, just an extraordinary exit. Yeah, hey, listen, uh, you know, uh, I, kudos to, to Ted, to Josh, and uh, Joe Cantonese for de developing a great technology. Uh, but, you know, you get a great technology, then it comes down to, you know, we've tried to introduce Urolift the right way. We, we're very keen on not having every urologist do Urolift. We want the right urologist to do it and developing a, a, a great culture within the organization. And it's been, it's been a great journey. We've, uh, we were planning to IPO in um, October of 2017. Uh, we did have a lot of strategic interest throughout, um, um, you know, over the last five years. But so no you one, did or you did not? We did. A lot of strategic interest, and we ended up actually, what's nice to have two horses in a horse race, we ended up having two strategics as we got closer to the IPO, um, start, you know, really kind of working, working against each other and hopefully in actually driving our value up. So we were able to exit with a, a deal at uh, up to $1.1 billion. Did that, did that number surprise you? 
No, uh, we wouldn't have, uh, we would have IPO'd. I, I think from a board standpoint, I remember uh, us all sitting in a boardroom and laying out what would it take to take us off our pathway. And I'll tell you, the number was north of $1 billion. Wow, mm -hmm. phenomenal story. We are running up against time. I do want to get to Willow because it, it's such an interesting technology. And I know from talking to Josh, it's, it's really very much how he's thinking about mm -hmm. the world today. So John, yeah. you're, you're on Willow. Tell us about Willow, but uh, describe the technology. So Willow is, uh, is the, first all-in-one breast pump that fits in a, a bra. And uh, that's everything, the pump and the milk uh, collection and all that. And um, How the, did that idea the inspiration here was Josh and I uh, were talking. We said, hey, let's take a crack at pediatrics and maternity. And uh, I shared that with my wife, Sandra. And we chatted. And the next day at lunch, she's like, you know, you remember that breast pump was pretty awful. <laughs> and I said, you're right, it was. It was terrible, wasn't it? And I remembered her going to separate rooms. And, um, and the next day, she sent me an article that published in the New York Times about, in the Motherlode blog, about why can't my breast pump be as quiet as a Prius and as cool as an iPhone? And uh, it's true. And anyone that so knows anything about breast pumps knows that's not the case. Um, and so talking to Sandra and talking to other moms really became clear, like, one, how amazing moms are and what they do for their children and, and what they go through and, and being tethered and not having hands free. And, and, and Josh and I really sparked to this how, wow, there's a need. And, and the mantra before we even knew what we were going to do was, can we help moms pump anywhere, anytime uh, with dignity, you know, you know, around anyone? And, uh, and then the search began. And it was clinical research, understanding about feeding and nursing and all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, to, to make this time short, because we, we're, we came up with the aha moment of how we could fit this pump technology into something that's small and fits in the bra. Yeah. Yeah. Inspired you, by how a baby feeds. The right. Actual, like inspired by, by the anatomy. The actual mechanism. That's right. The, and the anatomical mechanism is ex almost exactly what you could do inside the pump. Now, both the Clarent and, and Neotrack were in a relatively crowded technology field. I mean, the Clarent was different, but there were lots of... As you did your research, was there anybody working on this? I mean, why didn't Apple have this on the drawing board at some point? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the things Is that... Is there we, anything else like this? There's, there's nothing like this. There's established pumps. Uh, there's a lack of innovation. Similarly, yeah. this is an area where the pump innovation yeah. happened 25, 30 years yeah. ago. I think a consistent theme for all these, in every single case, these were bad places to go where nobody really wanted to be. Right. And, you know, why would, you know, hardware, you know, consumer, um, you know, just in, not an attractive, gro not growing fast, not a lot of innovation, not a lot of investment, you know, not a lot of VCs, you know. All the VCs were tired of, of uh, BPAs. They were, in fact, down near when I first printed, they were going to go into ENT, it was like, that is not a good space, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So just that, that, but that is what we like to do. We, when everyone's going left, we like to go right. But consumer, is, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to bring up Willow, yeah. because of the consumer angle, that's actually an attractive thing if you yeah. don't have the same kind of yeah. reimbursement or payment issues. Does Willow, in the sense of being yeah. consumer, maybe digital, represent a new direction for Absolutely. Exploring? Yeah, I think it's a great, I mean, we've had a few there, but it's a perfect embodiment of a consumer product that is actually going to have a profound impact on morbidity and mortality for babies and moms. I mean, it's, it's going to be as, as impactful as any of the medical devices that we've created, um, but it's really going to um, have a broader, even broader impact because it is consumer, because it can spread doesn't have to be sort of handed down and through conferences and with sales reps and stuff. Anyone can access it and eventually have hope across the world. And by allowing moms to, the, the, to facilitate their ability to feed their babies breast milk, they will improve their health and their own health as well. And are you developing a consumer, direct to consumer marketing plan for mm -hmm. Willow? Oh, it's already on the market. It's available. How's it doing? Doing great. Good. Naomi's here. It was our CEO for, uh, for Willow, and uh, it's, it's an exciting time for Willow. So we're right up against time here, and I guess just to kind of final wrap-up question, let me turn this back to Josh and the Project Architects. As you think about ExploreMed going into the future, do you have a model that you think works and works well and is sustainable, or do you think ExploreMed model, ExploreMed may survive, but the model's got to change? I th think we're always trying to learn. 
from the mistakes that we make. We always make a lot of mistakes, but the theme, the central theme is, uh, is exactly what I said, just focusing on the needs, trying to find that space that's not filled. And the reason why I wanted all these guys here is this is the magic, you know, this, the, the talent that's here. These guys, um, they, you know, as you can see, different skill sets, different expertise, but passionate, smart, you know, capable, experienced, and good, good human beings, and I'm so proud of them and so many of the people here in the audience who've worked in our companies. And have the same process or change? What, what do you see coming for Explorer? First of all, I think we'd all say that Josh is the magic, so as much as he <laughs> says that about us, I mean, he really is the, the spark. He's the secret sauce behind it all. But um, yes, the model is uh, changing. Um, we had to change as we got into that really dark period, you know, after 2008, 2009. Um, we started tweaking our model and we started doing things slightly different. Capital efficiency is even way more important than it's ever been. And so we are m making adjustments. Yeah. And we could, we'll continue to, you know. Great. Ted or John, you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I think what's, what's really not changing is what brought me into this whole thing to begin with. And that is it's, it's an opportunity to improve the lives of others working with people that are incredibly capable, motivated, and driven, and it is just a wonderful environment. So, Josh, hats off to creating that. Thank you. Well, great. Yeah, That's you. a wonderful way of stopping. Let's uh, thank Josh and his team, and Ab and John. And thank you. Thanks. And thank you. And and thank you for watching. There's a reception. Hi. Uh, outside, we, we invite you before, to before we go outside, I have one request. Sure. I, I have a... I, there were so many people who I wanted to invite to be on the stage. Of course, we had sure. to, uh, you know. But what I would like to do is to get a picture, if we can. If you've ever been an employee or involved in any of the Explorement companies, please come up. If, you've, if you're my family members, please come up. And if you're uh, part of Biodesign, either faculty member, student, or, or advisor, or mentor, please come up. Let's get a big you're picture. Fill the stage. That's going to be fun. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Come on up.